Investors Chronicle. Hello and welcome back to Lee and the IC. My name is Alex Newman, an Associate Editor at the Investors Chronicle, and I'm once again very pleased to be here in the FT studios for the fourth and final conversation of 2023 with Lord John Lee. As regular listeners will be aware, everything we talk about on this podcast is filtered through the thoughts, actions, feelings and experience of one of the most seasoned personal investors in the country. That necessitates the disclaimer that Though we will be talking about individual stocks and John's portfolio in detail, this podcast is purely for educational purposes and nothing in it should be taken as financial advice or recommendations to buy or sell shares. This month, we're going to mix things up a little bit. Instead of a deep dive on one company, we're going to conduct a mini end of year audit on five smaller holdings in John's portfolio before getting his thoughts on the market as we enter 2024 talking about a novel idea for using shares to encourage financial literacy in schools and how you might want to broach the topic of investing around the Christmas table. Anyway, let's get to it. John, very warm welcome to you today. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. So as mentioned, this is going to be a bit more of a quick fire round on some of your smaller holdings, what they do, how you came to be invested uh, and how they've performed over the past year and your current position and thoughts. So I wanted to start with I think one of your smaller holdings, that's the litigation financing firm Manalit. Manalit. Yeah, I always mm-hmm. used to call them Manalay, but Manalit. So they list at the end of 2018 at 200p on a, on a wave of interest in their market for litigation funding, now trading at just under 160p. What's the story here vis-a-vis your holding? Well, the story is that um, they had a very, very difficult time during uh, during COVID uh, because if you if you recall, the government effectively prevented companies being put into uh, into liquidation or similar, and therefore it was a pretty lean time for for Manalit. But I bought them on the an- on the anticipation that uh, uh, clearly uh, there would be, uh, regrettably, but nevertheless this is realistic, uh, build up of um, uh, of insolvencies um, mm. post. Uh, post COVID, you know this this is uh, turning out to be the case. Sadly, in many ways, but of course, Manalit do perform a very useful public function uh, in chasing directors uh, and others who misappropriated corporate funds. So um, they've seen a significant pickup in in business. Mainly, they tell me of uh, on smaller claims. Uh, rather than some of the larger, uh, the larger situations, but they they say that is the normal pattern that the smaller companies tend to tip over first, and then some of the larger companies hang on for mm. uh, for, for rather longer. Uh, so um, they're anticipating um, quite a significant increase in activity. Indeed, they're already seeing it, but as I say, with the smaller companies, and they've increased their uh, their legal staff to handle. And then, of course, they've also recently been involved in a pilot scheme uh, for Barclays, I think it was, and um, that apparently has been uh, successful. So um, everything is is going in the right direction, uh, apart from the dear share price, right. which has which has sagged somewhat. So obviously, I'm I'm it, it's a smaller holding of mine, mm. uh, somewhat more speculative than than. Uh, holdings that I normally have. But, uh, you know, I am anticipating over the next 12 months a useful recovery in the share price. And indeed, it's one, I think it's one of my, uh, one of the three stocks that I've selected, one of the, one of the competitions that I participate in with, with uh, investing friends that, that will perform the best in 2024. Yeah, the the just just a bit more clarity on the the funding they do. Who who is it that they provide funding for? And where does that where does well they don't provide funding. What actually happens is, as I understand it, mm. uh, that the administrator mm. uh, of a company or so or the liquidator calls in a company like um, Manalit. Uh, when I say like Manalit, there aren't many others. Mm. It's pretty unique, uh, and they they then use their skills. To, to get money back from directors and others who've misappropriated funds. Right. So they don't provide any any money themselves, mm. or, although they do buy cases, as it were, for, for apparently fairly small amounts of money. Okay. One of the questions around, I suppose, modelling legal assets is that it can be a little hard to do. You've got judgment calls on recoveries, etc. I, I suppose they're public 
track record is is still fairly limited and we've had this sort of blunted cycle as you said what's your feeling on on you know this slightly novel asset class well i mean clearly they they do fulfill a a significant function mm. um in in chasing those who who've behaved improperly and badly so uh i think that um uh, I, well, I hope that that when the the bottom line begins to improve, and I hope it improves significantly, then uh, I think you know they they the shares hopefully will rise, and uh, you know their rating will improve, and the, the awareness of the company, I think, will uh, um, uh, will increase as well, which is important. And and just just finally, I mean. You know, this is in some ways a hedge to play on the UK economy because it's it. You know, when Man Elite succeeds, it's not necessarily because the economy is doing incredibly well. Does that is this? Uh, should we read into this that your 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 sort of view of the UK economy is uh, may, maybe sort of softening? cautious? It's, it's no, no I, well, no, no, far from that. I mean, one of the things, one of the features um, that I've been very conscious of recently is is um, you know of the the quality of the results of of most companies that I'm invested in. Quite frankly, the results are are pretty good, and um, you know those who who were really forecasting doom and gloom, I think, have proven been proven to be totally totally wrong. But inevitably, um, there always will be business failures and insolvencies. And of course, we've we've had this pent up situation because of um, insolvencies being banned during during COVID. Uh, and of course, uh, once again, the, the 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 rise in interest rates clearly will have pushed a number of um, a number of companies over the cliff. Mm. I suppose the the important there's an important distinction, isn't there, that the UK economy is not the, thing, the same thing as the average listed stock market company, which tend to be slightly larger than the firms, I suppose, Manalita are dealing with. One of those one of those larger companies which has been having a good year um, is Hollywood Bowl. I mean, as a business, I suspect less introduction needed here. They run a bowling alleys around the country under the Hollywood Bowl brand. When did you first invest, John? Are you a keen bowler yourself? No, I, I, I think I may have bowled once in my life years ago when I was when I was younger. Uh, but I have been conscious of them as a um, quality smaller cap stock and um, took a, really took advantage uh, of the lowish price and the, the attractive yield. I think they were yielding, you know, four and a half mm. towards 5%. And uh, I had the opportunity of uh, meeting Stephen Burns, the, the chief executive, and talking to him about the business. And uh, I formed the view that they were extremely well managed, very tightly managed, mm. expanding in this country and expanding in Canada. Mm as well. Uh, so I was happy to come aboard. And of course, more recently, they've had good results. Uh, and um, the future looked quite rosy, both here and in the in the in Canada. And of course, the, the, their their rival, their main rival, I think it was called 10, was it 10 Entertainment? Yes, yeah. um, uh, has been subject of a takeover bid from uh, from the US. So that obviously has uh, has highlighted the attraction of of bowling because uh, you know it, it it's a very uh, cash generative business, and um, actually there are relatively few leisure quoted businesses, mm. leisure operated businesses that one can invest in, mm. uh, and I felt very comfortable with investing in in Hollywood Bowl, and um, you know it's checking up quite nicely. Yeah, I, I suppose like Manali. A bit of a casualty of the pandemic as well. I mean, they as a leisure as a leisure company, they weren't able to function really for 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 quite a lot of. Um, if we're looking back a, a couple of years now, that I mean, that ten entertainment deal very interesting for such a close peer. Th- it looks like that was struck at about twelve times forward earnings, something like a thirty odd percent premium to the share price. Do you think that looked overly cheap? Is I mean, I think it's a little bit on the cheap side. Yeah. Um, but then I don't know the business uh, like I know Hollywood, as it were. So I don't know, you know, how well how well run it is. I don't know much about it, to be quite honest. I, I opted for Hollywood Bowl, which I think is is uh, you know is a quality operation. Yeah. Uh, so um, we will see. Uh, so it's it's a useful holding of mine. It's not one of my largest ones or larger ones. But it's it's a useful holding, and um, you know I'm very happy to, uh, to to stay with it. Yeah. So yeah, and shares up nearing that um, that pre-COVID peak um, now. So thirdly, I, I think it's fair to say, you know, one of the bigger disappointments in the in the UK market, not just in your portfolio over the the past decade, uh, PZ Cousins, the, so the maker of hygiene, baby and beauty products, probably best known for Carex. So uh, I'm right in thinking this is a fairly long-term holding of yours? It's a long-term holding because I've got 
strong historical links with them. I think I'm still showing a profit on my shares, even though the, the capitalization has come down by about two thirds mm. over the last few years from a peak of about 1.8 billion to about 600 million today. And I was on the, on the board for, uh, for 10 years, uh, many years ago. Uh, and I was involved in the, the takeover by PZ, Patterson and Zaccomini, as, as it was then, of Cousins. Uh, and, of course, they were both Manchester-based company, which was my, my home base. So I have a, you know, a, a historical involvement and awareness uh, of them and um, considerable affection for them. You know, a fine Manchester company, um, one of the biggest quoted PLC certainly was in, in, in and on Manchester, a big supporter of the Commonwealth Games. In fact, I've still got a, an, I've still got a, uh, a very substantial Im Imperial Leather, one of, one of the Cousins products, Imperial Leather Commonwealth Games umbrella um, oh, wow. From those Commonwealth Games, and and it's it's still it's still uh, uh, still very functional, um, and uh, it reminds me all the time of um, of my time with PZ. But uh, from an investing point of view, they have been very very disappointing. And I've written relatively recently in the Financial Times, uh, drawing attention to what I believe to be the the significant uh, gap between the worth of the of the brands of the business and the overall capitalization of the of, uh, of the of the company i mean obviously they've had a very difficult time over the years with uh, nigeria which has been a difficult market but a very big market for for pz uh, and of course we're talking about uh, a company that come uh, 2050 will be the third most populous country in the world so you know it's a huge uh, huge economy and a huge huge market and PZ are well positioned there with their brands having been there over 100 years uh, probably the largest if not one of the lar one of the largest uh, employers uh, in manufacturing in Nigeria but the business has been poorly managed in recent years there have been failures of acquisitions and I think it's probably also suffered because of uh, family control mm. uh, I think that have been snapped up by now uh, by one of the the bigger people in that sector, because some very big people in that sector uh, had the business not been controlled by family, I think that that control now is 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 beginning to to drift apart uh, with trusts and and senior members of the family not really being in the business now. Uh, so we, we'll see what happens. But um, the brands, are, you know, are, are significant, including Carex, which you mentioned, Imperial Leather. Morning Fresh and Sanctuary Spa, the the business, of course, in in very big business in Nigeria, I think is 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 very valuable. Mm. Even though obviously there are problems with it, yeah, I've got a big business in uh, baby products in Indonesia, once again a huge grain market, uh, and a bit significant business in Australia. Uh, and if you if you add up all the parts and all the brands and and brands do fetch big money, big money as we saw when. Uh, Mars paid 170% premium for Hotel Chocolat. Mm. More of that later, perhaps. <laughs> uh, you, you can see the value in brands. Mm. So um, I think uh, you know, PZ is, is a, a very interesting situation um, with, with no real downside that I can see. And the new chief executive is, is um, uh, I think, bringing considerable improvements to the business. And, um, uh, you know, there is a greater focus now uh, so one way or another, I, I, I think value will begin to come through in PZ over the next two or three years. Yeah, and I, it's an interesting case because I, I suppose the Nigeria division, while you know, a potential source of huge optimism, which you alluded to, I suppose has also been seen as a bit of a millstone around their neck for the last few years because there's you know, obviously lots of, lots of issues with Ni Nigeria's economy and the, the local currency and how that translates into um, a multinational's um, group earnings. I, I just wanted to pick up though on a point you mentioned about you know your sentimental attachment to this company, which you know, not not wanting to um, in any way sort of qu question that sentiment. But I suppose when it comes to investing, is that an, is that not sometimes an issue to have you know be sort of emotionally invested in the stakes for a company? I think oh, I think it is, um, and uh, uh, I suppose one cri one criticism of of my investing would be that I tend to be a little bit too loyal to companies that I get close to. Because I do take an interest in the businesses, you know, I do try and establish a relationship with the with the the key people in the business who are running it. Mm. You know, I, I'm not a, a remote investor, as it were, who who, who um, just ignores the the business and the the employees and the the. I, you know, I'm I'm frankly proud of 
many of the businesses that I invest in. And, you know, PZ is, is uh, you know, a very good company and uh, their products are, are, are good uh, and they support um, directly and indirectly a lot of charities, both in the UK and in, uh, and in Nigeria. And, of course, the other point um, is that because... My uh, shareholding is historic and was bought many, many years ago. I'm still sitting on a profit. So were I to realise, uh, it's not in my ISA, mm. uh, were I to realise there would be capital gains tax to pay. So that's another consideration uh, in terms of moving out. But, um, you know, as I say at the moment, I think the, the, the shares are, are good value. So it's a useful holding of mine, medium-sized, I would say, uh, so we're just watching and waiting. Yeah, and I suppose it underlines the point that, you know, whatever's happened to the share price, it's, it's still the valuation that you have to reappraise continually, you know, mm. look, looking forward. The fourth stock I'd, I wanted to touch on, FW Thorpe, an, another homegrown uh, UK company with a, a growing global uh, footprint. Um, I mean, they look to be in, 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 in slightly better shape. So the, the, it's a designer of, and manufacturer of professional Lighting, which now makes about half its sales outside the UK. Um, I mean, what what lit up your investment imagination with this? Yeah, company, like the lit up, lit up. I yes, well done. <laughs> well done. Well uh, done. It ticked all the boxes many years ago when I first invested in it. Uh, once again, it was a, fam- a family control. I think it still is pretty well a family control. The, Thor- the Thorpe name. business. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I did visit it years ago in in Redditch. I think it, it was based or is based, and uh, it was conservatively managed, which, which is what I like to see. Um, there was a strong sort of proprietorial presence there, and it had a lot of cash. It's always been very conservative and still has um, you know, a big ca- a big positive cash position, which I like to see, mm. rather than debt, quite obviously. And uh, over the years, it has grown and uh, has paid increasing dividends and special dividends, uh, and it's turned out to be, over the years, a very successful investment. But in more recent years, the share price you know, has been uh, somewhat flat. I think it's pretty fully valued at the moment, but a very, very solid business. But once again, not dissimilar from PZ uh, in that it's a historic holding of mine. And if I were to dispose of it, once again, CGT would come into play. Yeah. It's also, of course, uh, I think I'm right in saying quoted on AIM as well, yeah. which carries inheritance tax advantages. And when you're in the in the 80s, as I am, uh, that's something you do take into account. Yeah, we do, we do have a question from a listener, uh, Vincent, on on this company who maybe is looking at things in slightly more risk based terms. His question was: Is is the company undervalued, or is this transition to LED lighting a threat to the business because of the replacement life cycle of you know lot longer lasting lights? I suppose that's a consideration for every uh, every product manufacturer. It's like if you're making too good a product, that can sometimes be a, a bit of an issue. I yes, I, the answer is I, you know it, it's a, it's it's a fair question, and I don't fully know the answer mm. because I'm not really I'm not that close to uh, thoughts, but you know maybe I should should make contact with them again and and reestablish relationships. So I couldn't really I couldn't really answer. All I would say is that that yes, there is clearly a replacement aspect of of the of new LED. But at the same time, you know, because of the quality of their of their lighting and products, they're involved in in many of the new sort of infrastructure mm. uh, developments. Uh, and so, you know, we get a Labour government next time committed to major infrastructure spend. Obviously, there'll be lighting involved, and I would imagine Thorpes will, will be benefiting from that. And of course, they've pushed, as you rightly say, globally now. It is a global business. I think they're, they're into Holland. Mm. Uh, in in quite a big way, and uh, so the the product challenges are obviously something that all all boards and managements do face. Mm. And all I would say is that that you can only judge uh, the quality of management by its track record. Uh, you know what it's done rather than what it says uh, says it's going to do. And uh, you know their track record is very good and solid. So I I would back them. Yeah to know what they're doing with their, their products and, and um, focusing on growth areas. Uh, I mean, well, certainly what we can say about this business is that energy efficiency is a, me- is a mega trend. That's not going away. So however they've considered strategically addressing their, their end markets, they, are, they do have a, have a tailwind at their, their backs, don't they? Correct. So finally, the, a company we've, I think we've briefly touched on before in the podcast is uh, Goodwins. Um, uh, they had results uh, out uh, this week, 
uh, or as you, you may be listening to it uh, last week. Um, but before we get onto that, could we just just recap on 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 what Goodwins do and and you know why it's a, a company you're excited about or have been for a long time. Very very uh, very excited about it and impressed with it. And I visited it um, with a group of investors mid year. Uh, it, it's a company I've been I. I've been very slow to become aware of, but then they do, uh, as a company, hide their light under a, a little bit of a bushel. They're very conservative and family controlled, based in the in the potteries. But when I visited, I was hugely impressed with the commitment of the uh, the current generation. It's probably a third or fourth generation business, and there are three or four members, young members, cousins who who now of the founders and similar who who um, are running the business of the different divisions. Uh, and, you know, they're all uh, hugely motivated um, uh, with the business and, and their ambitions to, to take it forward and, and, and build on the legacy that they've inherited. Uh, and uh, some of the products that, that uh, they've got are really very exciting, like, for example... Uh, one that they think has got huge potential, which is um, a, uh, uh, a fire extinguisher, a lithium fire extinguisher for, dis- for extinguishing lithium fires, uh, which, uh, which they've just uh, produced and patented, and they believe it's got huge potential worldwide, particularly in the in the USA. So they've got a number of very interesting divisions. Uh, they they, they um, uh, produce powders for jewellery, uh, submersible pumps. They produce radar, sort of lightweight radar for developing countries, which they think has got significant uh, potential. And also, of course, their basic business with a very heavy sort of, uh, you know, castings and refractory ability produces um, some major steel castings for... Um, uh, for our submarine program and for the uh, U.S. submarine program as well, they're very significant suppliers, and so they'll benefit from the the increased spend on on submarines, and also, of course, very likely to benefit from the um, the, the new AUKUS deal with Australia. Uh, so big potential there, and they've all, also developed put quite a lot of money into a new product called the Velco which is supposed to be a um, very, very high temperature polymer. Uh, apparently there's only one other company in the world that is capable of doing what they believe they can do. So many attractive strands to this business that I see a, a surge in revenues and a surge in profits over the next few years. And, of course, it is increasingly uh, noticed now as a PLC and the, the valuation has risen. But it's, you know, it's a very solid one to tuck away, I think, for the medium to long term. I suppose the the comparison with PZ Cousins, these aren't brands they're managing, but there's lots of product lines, aren't there? That they're, and and you know, it sounds like you know quite a few more sectors uh, in addition to the, the ones that that PZ are facing. What's your where do you get this confidence from, though, that they don't just have a kind of grab bag of different technologies and products that in markets which sometimes are doing well, sometimes it's a little bit uh, shakier, and that actually it amounts to one collective big growth story what do you, do you get a sense of how they go after their markets and the, 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 the I, th- I, I think I think the I think the answer the answer is overall I would say the quality of the management the, okay uh, and that historically has been the comparison with with PZs I think they've thought through which areas they should be in they were originally I think quite heavily involved in in oil and gas mm. and then of course there was quite a big downturn there so they I think they thought about the areas that that really uh, did offer considerable scope given their expertise. And so, you know, the submarine side, the um, huge sort of lead, lead boxes uh, that they provide for Sellafield, for, for um, you know, nuclear, nuclear waste, uh, quite a significant contract there. Their focus on uh, uh, f- producing a fire extinguisher for lithium fires uh, all this, you know, demonstrates to me, you know, a, a very, a very considerable uh, um, focus on 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 looking ahead to to growth areas and growth opportunities, and I think that does mark them out. Yeah, I always think with engineering companies, I, I, I will never claim to un- always understand the niches that they might be in, but you know, the idea of an, an engineer running a business, there's something definitely attractive about that, isn't there? Because you know, th- these are people whose job it is to 
to find solutions to real tangible problems in the world. It's not just a case of thinking of a product to sell to a consumer. These are s- solutions that someone is in need. Uh, is someone in need is of, in yeah. need. I mean, these are serious products. And of course, it, it's a serious employer in mm. the in, in the potteries. Yeah. Uh, and uh, also they have a big apprentice intake as well. So, I mean, it's, it's a very important company. But I think it was, I think <laughs> in terms of what you're alluding to, I think it was one of the Rothschilds who some some years ago said that the three wa- there are three ways of of losing money, wine, women and engineering. Oh, right. <laughs> the, the, the first two are the most enjoyable, the last yeah. one is the most certain. OK. But uh, I think uh, Goodwin has, has, really, has really proven that wrong, as okay. it were. They do make money out of engineering. Yeah, there is an adage uh, for, to the contrary for every, every, every bit of wisdom out there. So, I mean, the broader backdrop to all of this is that, you know, in the UK, I think we can say now rates are looking like they've peaked if if not yet about to fall and it doesn't look like though you know opinions on this vary a, a, a severe recession is necessarily coming we've also had a spree of um takeovers for sort of sub 500 million pound companies and i think you mentioned you know you've seen some signs that there are uh, smaller fund managers with uh, overhangs kind of clearing their positions after a rough couple of years and that some overhangs might have uh, dissipated um, particularly for you know sort of smaller companies that we've been discussing, does this? Do you, do you think we're sort of we're at the, the it's a tough call, isn't it? But we're kind of at the bottom. We're at the bottom of of, of pessimistic sentiment, and uh, that things there's a bit more reason for festive cheer. Well, I think the I think the the small caps particularly have been uh, undervalued mm. for for quite a time. Uh, and I've always believed that value comes through in the end. One doesn't know what's going to you know, trigger yeah. a rise, but value always comes through uh, in the end, whether it's through a takeover or a, an upward re- re-rating. Uh, and uh, I was speaking at a, a mellow event uh, for investors about a month or so ago, uh, and the title of my talk then was, uh, quote, a great time to buy. Uh, and uh, I was encouraging people both to invest in the you know the bigger high yielding stocks like you know the Avivas and the M and Gs and Legal and Generals eight percent plus yields and also drawing attention to the end evaluation of many of our quality small cap stocks and I think what we've seen over the last um, uh, two or three weeks is a, a fulfilment of, of that prediction in a way that that prices have moved forward not quite across the board but uh, certainly um, in the majority of cases quite usefully. I think uh, over the last couple of weeks, I've not worked it out exactly, but I think my ISA is probably up about 5%. And we've seen some quite useful bounces uh, in, in stocks going up, small cap stocks going up sort of, you know, 7 or 8 9% in a day, really, um, when overhang, uh, overhang, selling overhangs are, are, are dealt with, as it were, or a little bit of positive buying uh, coming in, so um, I, I think there's a great danger in investors uh, just sitting on cash, and they're going to miss the boat. In my view, uh, they, they've I think already missed the first boat that's that's departed. Not not too late to buy, certainly not. And but those who are sitting on a lot of cash and are rather cautious and think they're they're being clever, um, getting five percent or whatever it is. On cash, that is fine, but the the question they must ask themselves is how long is that going to last? Uh, you know, another six nine months maybe. Whereas, uh, you know, if you if you invested in in some of the high yielding stocks, good solid companies that that really shouldn't reduce dividends, if anything, hopefully roll them roll them steadily forward. You know, that's where you should be aboard. Uh, and mm. uh, uh, I, my broad message, you know, is is very much, you know, to it to invest and um, uh, and take the long view, not looking for any, you know, any short term advantage, but you know, getting into good companies at sensible levels. You obviously have a lot on your plate in terms of following the companies you already have um, in your in your eyes and your. In your portfolio john i mean that said are there are there companies you're looking at right now given the value out there and uh, i suppose the bounty of some of your larger dividend paying stocks uh, coming i'm tending it? yes i mean i'm one is always looking for new opportunities but uh, as a generalization my approach has been very much to uh, 
to build up the size of holdings in companies that I'm that I already feel confident in and take the long view and I acknowledge what I said a little bit earlier that sometimes I'm a little bit too patient a little bit too loyal maybe but you know there we are that is my uh, uh, my my uh, conservative small c uh, makeup and um, uh, an approach um many of the small ones that I'm in um have been you know pretty flat and of course some of them um like companies like Treat and Ampario have been very great companies but have been substantially derated over the last couple of years and and uh, I ne I never expected to see uh, the value of a treat come down by two thirds, um, you know, when the company actually uh, has performed pretty well and, and is still producing an attractive level of profits and has invested a lot in in new plant. But I, I think it will, will rise again. But probably from being somewhat overvalued a few years ago, maybe some of these stocks are a little bit undervalued now. So, John, since we last spoke on, on this podcast, you've been uh, campaigning in, in, in both Parliament and beyond for an idea you've suggested might help to improve financial literacy or numeracy in, in schools through shareholder ownership. Can you, for, for those listeners who, who might not have picked up on the, the idea so far, can you just briefly outline it, its background and, 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 the, and the feedback you've, mm, you've sure, had very, since? Sure, very happy to do that. Yes, very conscious of, of the, 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 the statement in... Uh, or well, the commentary in, in the Chancellor's autumn, autumn statement about the, the future of the government's 38 39% holding in NatWest Bank and the, the intention or the possible intention to dispose maybe via a sort of a, the tell Sid type route in involving uh, the, you know, the, 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 um, the, you know, the people out in, in, in the country rather than the lines of the earlier privatisations of the of the Thatcher government that I was a little bit involved in when I was involved there uh, as a member as a member of Parliament, conscious as I am, and I think we all are of, of the uh, I say near zero. People think I'm exaggerating, but I think it's probably true. The near zero financial education that exists in most of our schools. It seemed to me that that an interesting idea uh, might be to try and uh, somehow involve schools, particularly the state secondary schools, in that uh, further disposal of NatWest shares. So I came up with the idea of the, the government gifting, say, £5,000 worth of NatWest shares in the disposal to, um, uh, to each of the second or offering them to each of the secondary schools in the country. And we have about 4,400 of those. So the total cost, if, if every school, every secondary school said, yes, I'd like my £5,000 worth of NatWest net shares for free as a gift, that would cost the state £22 million, which is frankly a drop in the ocean. Now, um, I believe that, that gifting the schools and involving the pupils would actually really begin to be, to be transformational uh, and on the first step to really increasing awareness and interest because that £5,000 would produce a dividend of about £350, and my idea would be that the pupils themselves in those secondary schools would decide how that £350 is spent and they would vote. Maybe the senior classes would. So they could decide to buy an item for the, for the, school, uh, for the school laboratory or the gym uh, or, or uh, subsidise a, uh, a trip from somewhere, a museum or whatever, um, or a camping trip, uh, or maybe... Uh, spend the money on supporting a local charity, a local food bank, whatever it is. Um, but the, the point is the pupils themselves would take that decision. Obviously, the teachers would would structure the, the you know, the vote, as it were, and, and uh, draw attention of the pupils to the options. But the pupils would decide. So for the first time, uh, and then also parallel to that, uh, because the school owns the shares, the pupils could then participate digitally in the NatWest AGM, as an example. And I would hope that NatWest, you know, might send in uh, some of their, um, their their managers and similar and staff to give talks on financial education. So really, through this this very modest amount of money in in state terms, in national terms, twenty two million pounds, you know, one could really begin to to. Uh, to teach and encourage youngsters to become aware of how banks operate, uh, how the stock market to an extent operates, what a dividend is. Uh, and um, uh, I think a little bit of thinking outside the box, 
you know, could produce um, substantial dividends for for the pupils themselves, maybe for some of the teachers who perhaps uh, may be lacking a little bit of financial knowledge themselves, uh, and also benefit the the state. And I have to say that everyone, everyone that I've mentioned the idea to, uh, both in, inside Westminster uh, and outside, and indeed um, you know, the, the reaction I've had from one or two public companies where I've suggested they might give some of the free shares to, to say, secondary schools in their locality, uh, you know, has has um, received a positive response. And my plan in the uh, in the new year is to um, make a serious approach to uh, the Chancellor, um, really led by a number of, uh, hopefully a number of uh, Conservative peers, uh, former Cabinet Ministers who are equally enthused with the idea. And I've already written to Howard Davis as chairman of the NatWest Bank to get his reaction. Obviously, I didn't expect, and it's impossible for him to, to say, you know, what a great idea, as it were. But uh, I would certainly say that he didn't close the door and uh, really said it's very much up to the Treasury and, you know, encouraged me to talk to the to talk to talk the Treasury uh, about it. So uh, all to play for in the new year. Yeah, really, really looking forward to following this story and, and see how uh, the, the, those next steps uh, pan out, John. Just finally, I mean, regarding engagement and financial literacy, while we're on the topic, I, I just wanted to conclude by talking a bit about Christmas, about the festive season. I mean, for many, this is a time spent with family, also for reflection. I mean, personal finance and investing might not always feel like a festive subject, but um, but, you know, given listeners are thinking about their finances and investing, and we often reflect and look forward to the, a new year is this a time to to start a conversation and, and if so do you you know do you, what are the important points to to discuss you know when we're, we're spending time with our families potentially in, in the next couple of weeks well i think i think uh, obviously the christmas break gives people time to reflect as it were uh, uh, and to maybe uh, look at their overall financial position and and um, budgets for next year and savings and holiday plans and that type of thing uh, but also um uh, you know i would suggest that they you know should begin to think also about maybe those who are interested in investing and believe in 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 investing in the stock market and you know have some funds to invest thinking about empowering uh, the next generation for the years in my case uh, you know i built up portfolios for both my daughters which they're very appreciative of, but I've never really, I've never really managed to engender a great deal of interest from them. Uh, so I'm, I have uh, start, I started a couple of years ago to adopt a rather different tack with my two, with two of my four grandchildren. Then I think nine and nine and six, nine and seven, and I uh, created a, a junior ISA for each for for the two, for each of them, putting five thousand pounds into a junior ISA. You can't do it directly as a grandparent, heaven knows why, but you're not allowed to do it. You have to do it through their parent. I've noticed this recently yeah, as well. You know, yeah. it's crazy. <laughs> so then I discussed with them uh, the sort of shares we should buy. And what I, what I focused on was investing for them in a number of companies that they could identify and relate to, um, like for the sake of argument, you know, Hollywood Bowl, like Greggs, like the supermarkets, um, and Marks and Spencer, Bloomsbury Publishing, who published the Harry Potter books, for example. So ten or twelve companies. I think we had uh, ten of five hundred pounds each. Uh, Hotel Chocolat was one of them. Irrespective of the investment merits of those companies, they they could understand that they own a small slice, a very small slice of those businesses, and so I. I try, I'm trying to educate them through that particular route. And, and um, we had a, a review uh, some months ago of the first year. Uh, overall, I think we made a slight profit um, uh, and one or two disappointments. So actually, we we made some changes and, I, I, and we decided we'd sell Hotel Chocolat. Um, which was had run into all sorts of trading problems. And then, of course, lo and behold, um, a few months later, along comes a bid from Mars at 170% premium to the prevailing price. So, so we got that wrong. As, as one of our sell ideas uh, this this year, that was uh, that was our shared pain, I think. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> but we can console ourselves with chocolate, I suppose. Sure. I suppose over but, the- but interestingly, what, what, what the Hotel Chocolat bid, and it was at, at 170% premium on the prevailing price, was the value that um, Mars 
rightly or wrongly, mm. put on the, the brand Hotel Chocolat, which is known. So it, it comes back to the point I made earlier about, um, with PZ, the value of brands and, and companies do, do pay a lot of money for established brands. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There is, an, there is a way in through intangible assets after all. I, uh, I think there's lots to explore in our next conversation in, in January, um, which of course includes any questions you'd like to put to John. Uh, you can do that by emailing me at alex.newman at ft.com. Until then, all that's left for me to do is to wish you, dear listener, a happy Christmas, New Year and a successful 2024. And as ever, to thank you, John, for your thoughts. Thank you very much indeed and a happy Christmas to all those who who listen and successful investing. Yes, indeed. And also to our our producer, Maddie Apthorpe, for all her work behind the soundboard. Until next time, thank you. (music) 